Welcome to Rauta. This video is done in commercial collaboration with our sponsor Steelfest. Hello and welcome to Rauta's very new concept video series, this being the first episode. And uh, before you even start typing your comments, if you're one of the more advanced listener or hobbyist of black metal, this is probably not for you. This video series called Crash Course Through Norwegian Black Metal 1990s, or something along those lines anyway, is mainly directed to people who are looking for some bands from nowhere, like where to start, where I am going for when I'm looking for to know, you know, some Norwegian black metal bands, especially during the 90s. Now, especially these first editions or episodes of this series will focus on the bigger names. And that's why I have renamed uh, or named this one, the first episode, as the essential ones. I'm trying to include a few bands, not necessarily just three bands per episode, so we don't get too uh, distracted by a vast amount of bands. Because when I was putting on this list, I could easily find like something like 50 names. And originally I was like going to do them in some kind of order, like best 50 bands or something like that. But as the list kind of started expanding beyond original 20 or 30 bands, I decided, okay, let's include no more than five bands per list. And then my thumbnail guy, Chris, actually pointed out maybe better focus on three bands instead of five because you end up anyway rambling too much and going through even the Slider's take on the discographies with these bands would make these videos very, very lengthy. Now, this shall act as the introduction to the whole series. And like I said, I will be making these videos in various amounts of bands and focusing from bigger to the smaller ones. Why in such an order? Why not from, you know, worst to best or whatever? Because it would be kind of a very debatable, very hard to figure out which bands are actually better ones than the rest. And to be honest, making this video to start from the bigger ones, the ones that everybody know is kind of easier. So basically, in essence, I'm going to do a little bit of digging. We'll start from the grassroots and then we're kind of uh, going down the hole. So first, I'm going to start talking about these bigger ones, which I'm here going to call them essential ones. And then we're going more into the underground. So probably those ones who are already veterans of black metal and know black metal throughout, or are very just well versed throughout, you know, Norwegian black metal, probably have nothing of interest in this first episode because you know it all. Anyway, being a long ramble uh, before we get to talk about these three bands I've selected for these, this episode are Mayhem, Burzum, and Darkthrone. Not in that order, however. Now. Obviously, before I started making this video series, I was pondering like which band to start with. Now, if I were going to go mainly just po based on popularity of these bands, this list would be a little bit different because none of these are exactly in the uh, top, well, Mayhem excluded, none of these are exa exactly the biggest one in terms of number. Those would be Demo Burger, Satyricon, Immortal, and yes, Mayhem. But then it gets more complicated. And these numbers I have put together based on Facebook following, Instagram following, Spotify, and a little bit look on the Deezer side as well. And of course, you know, other factors. But I am not running these by numbers. I'm also taking uh, taking interest into like how much they actually contributed to black metal when they were founded and what kind of uh, impact they left on the scene. And for the purpose of talking about the music I have obviously been listening to, reminding myself about these albums. Now, I didn't go for this particular video, Burzum Discography, all over again, because I did it like a year ago and ranked the worst to best. For Dark Throne, I did it like three years ago, so I'm counting on my memory that much that I don't need to do that all over again. 
But for Mayhem, I decided to go to discography, mainly albums, but I decided to pick some other ones. So I can actually put them in some kind of a order, but this is not a ranking video by no means. And by no means I'm necessarily comparing one band to another because it really makes no sense. Everything kind of a in the end is all about your personal taste and what kind of stuff you want to. Now, this long intro finally done and we can get get start get it started. So first of all, the reason why I decided to pick Mayhem here is obviously you know, one of the main reasons. After all, it's the oldest Norwegian black metal band in the game. And why? while well, their impact on uh, black metal can be debated very much, obviously for following reasons, which I will mention it in a soon, um, it's no no, like a joke to say that Mayhem is one of the most important ones. I don't mean that their music is among the best of black metal from Norway, but let's be honest about it, they came before the others when it comes to black metal. I mean, for other countries, of course, there were bands like Bathory and Selifrost and Venom and all that stuff, but when it comes to Norway, uh, you know, basically there was nothing related to black metal before Mayhem. These are, once again, very debatable and someone I can already see in the classroom, you know, picking up the hand and saying like, but actually, not fuck you, actually. I'm just going to focus on the on the certain facts here. Now, there are various reasons why Mayhem beca became such an important name for black metal. First of all, it's mainly about Euronymous, the mastermind behind the band. Of course, there have been various amounts of other members in the band, but let's be honest about it. Whether you read a book, whether you wa watch Mayhem documentaries, and there are, by the way, quite many talking and directing, especially focusing on, especially in Mayhem, it's evident that Euronymous was the mastermind behind the band. Some could even go as far as to say Euronymous was as important to Mayhem as Squirtin was to Bathory, or Tom G. Warrior to Celtic Frost. You get the idea. Now, beyond that, all bets are off, because obviously this is also a very, very tragic band, having two essential members dead. Dead, the ex-vocalist being dead. Now, that is kind of a pun. And uh, obviously, Euronym is being murdered by none other than Varivikernes of Persum, which is partially the reason why Persum is also in the top three list here, the first episode. But, of course, these deaths, these tragedies, are not the only reason what made Mayhem so important. I mean, of course, what matters is that like I said, they were there before the others. Now, when we start looking at the discography or lineup, doesn't matter in which order, but maybe we'll go with the members first. The thing here is there have been a lot of people in the band and <laughs> various vocalists, dead being dead, and then there was Attila, who is still again with the band, but it was already like 10 years, 11 years before he was actually the vocalist of the band. Uh, there was, of course, Maniac, who was a very important part of the band also, and so on. Then we have these other members who have been more or less key members of the band, like Hellhammer, one of the best drummers in extreme metal of all times. Like, as you can see here, he has been in the band since 80s. And of course, Necro Butcher, I guess it's safe to say, the current leader of the band, also one of the founding members of the band. The rest have been so much like... Uh, coming and going, and if you take a look at the members list, it's quite a big. So when you take a look at this list and understand this band is still, you know, somewhat valid, somewhat like being together and all that stuff, it's actually interesting they managed to do, you know, such a big thing happening. I mean, let's be honest about it, Mayhem is not those one of those bands which is super active when it comes to releasing albums. I mean, they are not exactly Marduk, or if we go beyond Black Metal, Cannibal Corpse. So actually, quite differently and quite interestingly, even though they were the oldest band, their first really meaningful release was Dead Crush. Now, this came, however, very, very early in 1987. It's very different than nowadays Black Metal, most part of it. But it's also quite different than what was going on in the 80s when it comes to black metal. So essentially very much like a key piece of a puzzle in so many ways. Now this already makes Mayhem very, very worthwhile because they were there ahead of their time, I mean by years. Basically none other band, no other band in, the, in Norway did an album or anything like that before 1990s. 
Then again, Mayhem wasn't exactly the first one to do that when it comes to albums, so they kind of missed that, but Dead Crush is, technically speaking, while it's an EP, as lengthy as some of the albums, so we'll let it slide, and we'll give the title of the pioneer work for Mayhem. I think it's grand. But more importantly, I mean, as good as Dead Crush is, it's, in my opinion, good, not great. Uh, the band also proved with the live in Leipzig album that they were really, really good early on. I mean, that came out in 1980, 1993, but that was obviously recorded a little bit earlier, and that was before lots of bands were basically just starting, you know, figure out what they want to do and all that stuff. And those vocals by Daddy are, in my opinion, the best what Mayhem probably ever did. I mean... Maybe some other recordings were better in terms of that, but kind of showing how good vocalist Dead was in essence. And there are lots of interesting rumors what Dead was doing, you know, with the gig and all that stuff. So this band essentially had very, very interesting characters, not only creating interesting music, but also very, very colorful backgrounds. And of course, Dead doing suicide, and then later on, Euronymous being murdered, all these kind of helped to build what Mayhem is, to kind of a massive legacy. So it's kind of a shame that, you know, the mystery to came as late as 1994, because in my opinion, it's one of the best black metal albums of all time, not only in terms of Norway, but in general. It's a five-star album, and when I was listening to it prior to making this video, I was like, man, this is so good once again. So decades after decades, it's just one of those albums that, you can't nothing but, you know, love it. It's just brilliant from production, which is quite different than a lot of bands going like, yeah, we, we should do anti-commercial sounding album in our cellar basement or garage. And meanwhile, the mystery is Tom Sathanas is like, yeah, this is not in Greek island, big place in, in uh, Bergen. Now, however, later on, I mean, Euronymous was dead and the band was probably picking up the pieces and figuring out what to do. Probably a, a lot of people, me included, were like, what's going to happen? And then came this interesting EP, Wolf Slayer Abyss 1997. And I remember it was kind of a disappointed, disappointment because it wasn't as good as The Mystery System Satanas. And again, most Norwegian black metal albums or any kind of black metal albums are not as good as that. But it was kind of a good. And um, there at least the rumors say that Euronymous legacy is still very much present with the songwriting and all. I don't really know about the facts. I mean, probably the facts and rumors are so messed up these days, it's hard to really get the facts straight. So let's not wor worry about it. What matters is that these two, including also Dead Crust, so these three basically are the ones that, in my opinion, shaped what Mayhem is and was supposed to be. And these are probably the ones, in case you're just new one, uh, trying to watch this video and learning what are the basic ingredients for Norwegian black metal with Banhold Mayhem, these are the pieces you need to figure out. Doesn't matter in which order you go, because they're all worthwhile. However, like I said, this is not a ranking video, but I would say stay away from Grand Declaration of War. It's even more horrible, in my opinion, nowadays than what it was in year 2000. I don't, th I don't understand how people are saying, like, it's 75% on average. It's horrible. It's not really, in my opinion, even a black metal album. It's more like a hybrid venture of some kind of a martial or dead industrial meeting black metal and trying to go into crossroads, like, figuring out what the hell we're doing. In my opinion, it's a mess, but that album has also fans. Now, when it comes to Chimera, Ordo of Cow, Esoteric Warfare... In my opinion, they are better than Grand Declaration of War, but not nowhere near in terms of quality uh, as with the album that came after that, or with The Mysteries. I mean, Demon is the only other Mayhem full album I'm willing to put into my compilation. The rest are not that good. And in my opinion, that is definitely something that still deserves attention. So for Mayhem, this crash course is giving you the advice. Stick with the Dem Mysteries Dem Satanas as the priority one. If that got you interested, Demon is definitely the second easiest step to take in. Dead Crash is a little bit different, as is Wolf's Lair Abyss, but at least those four albums or APs are worthwhile taking shot. And if you're not allergic to live albums like I Tend to Be, definitely li Live in Leipzig is worth taking a shot. It's, of course, live quality and 
back in the 90s, things were not as good as nowadays. But I mean, these few releases make Mayhem worthy. And of course, Mayhem is a good live band. I've seen them a few times and can't bitch about it. I mean, they do professional shows and all that stuff, but it's not for everybody. I mean, in a way, Mayhem's reputation as being a big ass badass band might be a little bit exaggerated. But then again, we cannot really forego those uh, tragic deaths. So there is that. Now, a totally different breed is Dark Throne. When Mayhem was touring and having deaths and having multitude of lineup changes, Dark Throne basically has been most of the times just two guys doing music and barely no lives at all. What makes it interesting is also that they started already in the 1980s, but they were not doing black metal in 1980s. And this was one of the culture shock for a lot of people, because Soulside Journey, the debut album that came out in 1991, for a lot of people it was like, yeah, this is the death metal one. I was too young for young to witness that era, but later on I've heard these stories that some people who got into Dark Throne with the demos, which are pretty decent, and then Soulside Journey were like, yes, this is the you know Norwegian take on whatever like sentence was doing in Finland and bands. Uh, in the Nordic countries in general, was shaping up with the kind of Nordic death metal. Of course, Sweden had its own style with Sunlight Studio and all that stuff, but Dark Throne had something on going on with their Soulside Journey album. So when the band totally changed the thing with the second album, A Blaze in the Northern Sky, which is considered a classic also, but for different reasons than Soulside Journey, some people were totally like upset, like, what well, is this madness? Like, this guy abandoned their somewhat technical and, to a certain degree, even somewhat progressive death metal. I mean, old school, yes, but not very simplistic and boneheaded, like, say, obituary. So, Dr. went into, like, 180 degrees turn and, like, fuck it, let's forget that complicated music, that the pro those progressive elements and the death metal sound and all that stuff, let's go for black metal. And suddenly they were like a different band. And some even make this distinction between Dark Throne, when the two words were separated, and Dark Throne, when the words actually got glued together, as if that was kind of like indication that the band suddenly changed overnight and all that stuff. Now, mind you, what is very, very important is that a lot of these good albums came back to back. 1991, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, and Gold Lord, technically speaking, is not a real album as such, but we could still call it another 1996. So the first few years, the band was super, super active. And um, when talking about numbers, by the way, this is an interesting point. Facebook... Mayhem has something like almost 700,000 Facebook followers. Dark Throne, less than 300. So this is the difference. When you go for Spotify, the difference is almost as big. I mean, Dark Throne has like more than 50% of what Mayhem has. And when you go Instagram, it's not that big a difference, but still, it's evident that Mayhem being a live band and Dark Throne being a studio band, they have quite a different following. Now, when it comes to music and in terms of quality, this is something that I went through with my Dark Throne Worst to Best video some few years ago. And uh, this is a different story. When it comes to black metal, however, we can just totally ignore Soul's Side Journey being a death metal album. And then we can go on from A Blaze in the Northern Sky, followed by three brilliant albums. In my opinion, some of the best albums in black metal or all metal ever. Under a Funeral Moon and Transylvania Hunger, both 10 out of 10 albums. So even better, in my opinion, than The Mystery Stum Satanus, but roughly they're both in the top five of Norwegian black metal albums. That was also followed by Panzer Force, which is, in my opinion, roughly as good as The Mystery Stum Satanus. I could just call all of them five out of five. Really good ones. It was only after that, with Total Death, when the band started to decline. Mind you, Total Death is a good album, but it's different breed. And then became this bumpy road with Ravishing Grimness, Plague Wielder and all that stuff, and we enter already 2000s. Now, mind you, a lot of people who were already, you know, listening to Black Metal in the 90s, kind of a, we, will remember this point, what I'm about to make. Norwegian Black Metal, the Golden Era, roughly ended around 1997. This is a little bit of for de debate where it actually ended. Was it by 1995, 1996, or as late as, say, 1998, or whatever. 
But that's when the whole Norwegian black metal entered the so-called Matrix era. Suddenly with the Matrix movie coming into play, everybody wanted to get those big ass trench coats and go for, you know, some kind of a vinyl clothing instead of leather and spikes. So suddenly no more Bathory Venom and all that stuff with leather and spikes and big ass nails. Suddenly it was everybody wanted to look like Neo from Matrix having those kind of uh, really slim uh, shades and all and bands also started, you know, shape up differently. So suddenly all these raw end of primitive black metal and embracing darkness became something different. Now, mind you, when you take a look, for example, Mayhem, the shift was indeed around 1997. Wolf Larabus was different than the Mysteries, and Grand Declaration of War clearly is of different era. For Dark Throne, it was roughly the same territory with ravishing grimness. It's having elements from, say, total death. But the, there is something like a big amount of time, big difference here, from 1996 to 1999. And mind you, the band was not doing gigs back in the days. They did early 90s. They even played in Finland, but they played the death metal era. So something definitely happened here. And obviously, I don't have the information what I would actually have to ask the band guys themselves. Like, what happened after 1996 when there was this big ass gap but obviously if we take a look at the members list here also you will find out that there has been preview members like some of the guys playing death metal arena but they were already gone by 1991 with the exception of Severus which was in the band from 1987 to 1993 one could say yeah Severus was key element of the kind of a golden era of Doctrine, but I would go further because, in my opinion, Panzerfaust and Charles Sylvanian Hunger, which came after that, almost also present. But anyway, Doctrine is an interesting one because the first era is death metal. Then came this classic black metal era when they shaped up whole black metal thing and they never did gigs or actual tours. So they were like the real misanthropes of Norwegian black metal. And one could say the third year started late 90s and continued very long uh, for 2000 something. And then by towards the end of 2000s, when Dark Thrones and Black Flags or even FOAD, Fuck Off and Die came out, the band had already started fourth era. And that's when they started abandoning black metal. So in terms of black metal, none of these releases here after that matter. Some people like them, some people don't. For example, I, I think Eternal Hails is the worst of Dark Throne of all times, and Astral Fortress is not much better. But these have very, very little to do with black metal. I mean, they're basically <laughs> even less black metal releases than Grand Declaration of War from Mayhem is that. Which takes us to the last band of this first episode, and that's Burzum. Everybody knows Burzum. Everybody knows it for the murder of Euronymous and uh, very weakerness, Mr. Burzum, Count Krishnak, being imprisoned not only for the murder but also arsons. But also for his um, quite active social media presence with this. He had this Tulian Perspective YouTube account which ran for years on, on YouTube and had quite a big of success and then was removed because Mr. Weakerness started to go way overboard with his comments, which, which were not that much accepted. Probably not the end user license agreement or whatever. And Burzum also became one of those bands that started to get, you know, people banned on Facebook temporarily, whatever. But there were these hate speech elements that got him or his followers into trouble, and to this still day, to this day, still affects that. But Burzum. Is something that I also went through with my discography run, where's the best, so I'm not gonna touch that uh, subject. Now, talking about the numbers which I mentioned, Burzum is not on Facebook and not on Instagram, so this is uncomparable to that. But when it comes to Spotify listings, this is interesting that it's roughly on the same level as Dark Throne, but even more popular, not on the level of Mayhem, but that I guess goes once again with no gigs policy. When it comes to uh, these are numbers, by the way because all of these bands are there. Mayhem is the biggest, but only a tad bit ahead of Dark Throne, whereas Burzum has less. So it's interesting that on Spotify, Burzum is bigger than Dark Throne, but on Deezer it's actually vice versa. Then again, Deezer is way smaller, but 
in case you want to do some kind of a math with the numbers, it's interesting. But because Burzum is not that much on social media, obviously it's hard to compare its popularity. But it's kind of given it's one of the most impactful of all Norwegian black metal bands and also one of the most notorious ones because of the murders, because of those uh, comments and opinions, you know, throughout his career post or pre-prison. But what matters in the terms of black metal is that Burzum, much like the Dark Throne, has different eras when it comes to the music. Now, Burzum was quite early on in the game. I mean, demos very early in the 90s, which made impact. Also, the Euronymous, who wanted to release his music, which is also one of the reasons which is related to his murder. You can learn all about this by reading some books or watching documentaries or interviews, whatever. But also what is important is that Burzum album came already in 1992. And this was also a very, very aggressive era in the terms of being really easy out. Dead Som Engang Var, Vislusse Taros, Philosophem, very much almost like back-to-back. And then there is this Burzum Maske EP, which then again includes just a previous releases. And mind you, these are not type of the releases which came in chronological order. They were actually supposed to uh, in different order, but it is what it is and uh, we cannot really change the fact. But what happened after Philosophem is that when Vikernes was prisoned, they came these albums which are nowadays called just Dungeons. And basically the same thing which Mortis, another important character in in Norwegian black metal, I mean, he was part of Mayhem, for instance, before he embarked into the uh, Dungeon Synth era, basically creating the style, he was also part of the band. So all these different key elements, key figures are, you know, one way or another related to each other. But what is also important is that when uh, Vigernes came out of the prison, now he did two more black metal releases. Technically speaking, from Deaths of Darkness is a metal release, but that's re-recorded song, so it doesn't matter, and it's not generally liked as much as the original one. But Bellows and Fallen are pretty good uh, metal comeback albums, so they definitely deserve your attention, even if they are not the cornerstone material so much as Dead Song and Gangbar, or Burzum, or in my opinion, the best Burzum ever, this Luce Taros, 1994. And whatever later on happened with Burzum here, uh, for, forward from 2011, all synth music, so not that important in terms of metal. So what makes Burzum so important is obviously these early years. Once again, mind you, when I said that Norwegian black metal started going decline roughly around 1997, very much fits Burzum as well. So all the important, all the best material happened before 1997. Dowdy Baldur's, first of all, it's not metal, secondly, it's not good. So, 1997 was one of once again the one of the the defining moments when things started to go south and Norwegian black metal started losing its crown to other countries. But once again if I had to recommend people to check out some of the Burzum material, like why Burzum is so important. Once again if you put his personality apart and, and the murder and all the non-musical whatever, uh, these are the elements, these are the important albums that came out, Burzum, Dead Sam Angangvar, Vislusetar Os, Philosophem, four really good albums, which definitely gets him the attention Burzum deserves. And once again, there are those two more metal albums which are pretty good. So when you compare Burzum doing something like six important black metal albums, rather good ones, to whatever Mayhem has here with, I don't know, two it's evident which one is better in terms of music. So once again, even if you don't do gigs, you can get this kind of uh, attention, particular because of the good, good albums, but also because of your high nose acts, including Murder and Arsons. But that only raises also the question mark. How come Dark Throne is so much like even when they don't gig and they don't have murders, they don't have these lineup changes? mainly because they did the best black metal of all times in Norway. But even so, their era was relatively short. I mean, if you really think about it, from 1992 to roughly 1996, and that's boom, done it in around five years. What matters though is that they also did quite a quite an amount of great albums. So these are the three bands, I would say, if you're a newbie, the Norwegian black metal, 
or any kind of black metal. These are the three bands you would go for. And now you have some albums to take on with you, like when you're going home or whatever. I don't know where you watch this video. Maybe you're at home or maybe you're doing a commuting, getting home from school or work. You're like figuring out, okay, making notes here. So make notes. Start with the mysteries to Satanat when you go for mayhem. When you go for Doctrine, I would say go with uh, Under a Funeral Moon or Transylvanian Hunger. But it isn't a crime really to go with The Blaze or Panzerfaust. But stick to the early 90s ones. And Burzum, pretty much the same thing. Focus on the 1990s ones. Because all of these bands have one thing in common, is that they lost their heads around after 1996, 1997. And this is some kind of an ongoing pattern, which you will see in later episodes as well, when I'm talking to you about the various bands in question and the various parts of their history. But once, once again said, if you want to go deeper in any kind of a particular part here, any ba given band mentioned in this video, go for the individual videos. Like, for example, I have done Dark Throne and Burzum discography runs, and I have done a Mayhem interview, so those will be also linked to this video in case you want to know more. Or if you just don't care shit about my opinion, because this is just me, an old man rambling about Norwegian black metal, maybe you just start your streaming service and start listening to these albums, and maybe you go for, I don't know, Lord of Chaos book, or maybe you will watch the Helvete documentary series, or some older ones on YouTube, which you can find and start digging for more information. What about the next episode, you're asking? Will it feature something more interesting than just old man rambling about bands and stuff happening in the early 90s? Probably not, but at least will it feature some different set of bands? And I'm guessing, brainstorming a little bit, and I would say three big bands from Norway. Some of them are bigger than this one in terms of number, but do, do they have as much impact in the Norwegian black metal scene? Maybe not. But deeper we go with each episode, and I hope this gives you some insight and some tips which albums to check out and which bands to follow. If not, well, don't blame me. Blame it on yourself. You're the one that actually watched this video all the way to the end. And off you go, go enjoy some uh, black metal and uh, let me know which are your favorite albums from these three bands. Until next time, bye bye.